So good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending this event, uh, looking at the recent HIV Commission report. Uh, this is a joint event uh, with uh, plus uh, LGBT plus Lib Dems with Gareth here, the chair. Thank you very much, Gareth, for organising and my able assistant tonight in the chat room as well. Um, also uh, uh, joining us on the event uh, is the Lib Dem Health and Care Association, which I'm currently chair for. You can see on the screen there. And we have two fantastic panellists for this evening. So we have Liz Barker, Baroness Barker, who's our LGBT spokesperson in the Lords and also spokesperson for the voluntary sector. Good evening, Liz, and welcome. And we have Manira Wilson as well, of course, MP for Twickenham and our spokesperson for health, well-being and social care. And you've been busy, very busy today as ever in Parliament, haven't you, Manira? Uh, yeah, it's just a bit busy with COVID and also as a London MP, we've had lots of last minute uh, briefings with ministers and officials uh, all day today. So it's a bit mad. Great. Well, especially given all that, thank you uh, very much again for coming on, on with us here. Also, we have on the call, I believe still, is uh, Richard Kemp who is the uh, opposition leader for the Liberal Democrats in Liverpool and also the spokesperson for the Local Government Association on Health and Social Care. Good evening, Richard. Nice to have, us, have you with Good us. Good evening from Penny Lane. Just in ah. case you don't know where I live, you do <laughs> now. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. So what we've got here, um, you can see on the screen there is a, a link. It will stay on each page. Um, the HIVcommission.org.uk. That's the full report. Uh, don't worry, there was no homework to read it for this evening. You can download it uh, at any time and have a read. There are 20 action points in it. And despite seeing some slides on the screen, you'll be pleased to hear there aren't 20 slides and I'm not going to read every word off every slide. So a bit of a change there. What we're going to do is we've pulled out a few of the key action points that we're going to have a discussion about. So we'll do that in a moment, but um, mindful that we've got Richard for a short while before he has to go. Um, I'm actually going to start with yourself, Richard, if that's OK. Um, so general comments about the Commission's report uh, would be great. Um, but as a specific question to get the ball rolling, we've obviously got the mass testing going on in Liverpool and uh, that's running at the moment. There's still lots of data to come in, but there appears to be some question at the moment about the access for less affluent people. So if you could just talk about the mass testing in general uh, and then linking it back to how that might help us in the future with HIV transmissions. Indeed, yes. Uh, before the mayor of Liverpool was arrested, he uh, did a lot of good work on the coronavirus front. And in fact, I... Uh, supported him that, as, as did the Liberal Democrat group. Uh, the big push has wound down now, but at one time we had 31 testing uh, sites and um, 2,000 army personnel helping us uh, with incredible efficiency. They arrived eight days after we agreed the programme with the government uh, and they set up the testing stations, not all at once, uh, and manned most of them. Uh, and of course, that meant with the lateral flow tests, they actually did the business with the science behind it and checked whether the uh, the virus was present, uh, present in those who were tested. In total, about 135,000 in Liverpool after the uh, as the army moved out had had the lateral flow test and about 25,000 had the uh, better quality PCR test the lateral flow test you go it got a result in 30 minutes uh, the longer and those were people who were asymptomatic so they had no idea they had anything but as good Liverpool citizens they came along to be tested and we found about 850 people. Uh, with the virus present as a result of that process uh, and uh, about 2,000 people were found to be uh, positive for coronavirus with the PCR test and those were people who thought they had a symptom. It could have been a cold, it could have been a flu, it could have been something else, but they had some symptom and that's why there is a much higher number of people who tested positive from a smaller sample. Uh, so in total, about half the adult population of Liverpool came for testing. Uh, if you exclude under 11s, if you exclude the universities and care homes, which uh, had their own programmes, 
And in addition, about 20,000 people who work in Liverpool, they were also entitled to come, also had tests. And I don't know the results of those tests because the information went back to where they lived rather than was kept in Liverpool. That all sounds good, but it wasn't uh, presented uh, equally across the city. So I represent one of the wealthiest wards in Liverpool, Church Ward, and within days we were hitting 30 or 40 percent of people going in to be tested at the, the sites, uh, compared to about four percent in some of the poorer areas. So what the council did was firstly to set up some more testing sites uh, in the uh, areas that weren't coming forward, but then it reached out to those communities and uh, actually went door knocking. So knocking on the doors of those areas were local councillors, local clergy of all denominations, local community leaders, local GP staff turned up. And they actually knocked on the door and said, there's something at the end of the street. Come and be tested. We'll take you. If there's a language problem, we'll translate, uh, et cetera. Though, of course, one of the key reasons that some people had come forward in this area is because it's a wealthy area. Uh, we don't doesn't bother us if we have to self-isolate. We've been working at home as hard as we've ever done on Zoom with all the meetings and things that we do. And a lot of people here are fairly wealthy pensioners. In the poorer areas, the danger was you'd lose your money uh, because you're on zero hours contacts, uh, contracts, very poorly paid. Uh, but the important thing was that it was local people that did it, people who are trusted, people who are respected. And although the figures never got to anything like us that, uh, as high as they did here, uh, they did actually um, uh, hit far more respectable levels. Now, I think there are important uh, news there for any testing, uh, and I think the same will be applying for vaccination programmes as well, given the distrust about vaccination. Mm. It's the people who go and ask the people who might be affected mm. that make the difference. Having some minister or councillor Kemp on behalf of Liverpool doesn't cut the mustard with people who are scared, perhaps a bit ashamed, for whatever reason, don't want to come forward. The way to bring people out is to get people who talk their language, sometimes literally, sometimes figuratively, out into the relevant communities, the relevant meeting points, and say, come on, we'll come with you. Don't be scared. We'll take you through this process. And that gave a tremendous uh, amount of confidence. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, dealing with uh, sexually transmitted details, that is a very important thing to say. The most effective people that do that are those that are trusted by the organisations. And of course, there are uh, a reasonable number of them. But the difficulty is not those in the know who know where to go for help. It's those who don't know. And that's where you need to go digging where they might live, where they might congregate, where they might meet for recreation occasions. You need to go out to them because the powers that be, including me in a small way in Liverpool, can't do that. So that's the big lesson from Liverpool to me. Get the people who talk the language, who are trusted and go out into the community and actually deliver the programme. Brilliant. That's excellent. Thank you, Richard. And a, a really Pleasure. key point at the end, because uh, one of the key findings of the report, which uh, is pretty well known, is that, like you say, uh, a number of people are scared to perhaps to get a test because they're worried about what will happen if it's found to be positive, what support they'll get. Now, in, in terms of um, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, HIV in particular, um, there's been lots of uh, cuts to funding for local clinics. I know some areas of the country where the, the, the funding completely dried up. So can you just talk briefly um, on, on that one point in terms of um, areas where we need extra funding, such as um, for uh, what we call gun clinics? Um, is that a particular area, certainly in Liverpool, and you, you work with the LGA? Um, have we still got a, a massive problem in terms of a, a black hole of funding for um, sexually uh, transmitted disease clinics? We have a massive black hole in funding for everything to do with 
public health. Uh, what I haven't seen, and I don't know if this exists, but it might do, uh, Liz might know uh, this more than me, is whether there has been any particular study of the infection rates of people in particular uh, sexuality uh, positions. But to put it in context, uh, we've had an 800 million pound cut in all the public health uh, programs in England. And if you look at who died in the pandemic, it's elderly. Well, we'll all be old one day, but if you're healthy and elderly, you're much less likely to have died. It's the obese, it's people who are drug users, alcoholics. And when they talk about these underlying conditions that were created co-morbidity, it's all the things missing from the public health agenda. Uh, now, the NHS five-year plan, as you know, talks about moving things to prevention, mm -hmm. uh, but the money hasn't followed it. And in fact, I was dealing with mental health issues uh, recently, and the, the government has announced £50 million for the mental health uh, problems caused by corona. How much have they put into local government who deal with all the social determinants of health? Not a penny. It's all gone into institutional care. So I'm afraid anyone who's looking for an enhanced public health service in any sphere at all, you're out of luck at the moment because we're really scraping the barrel in local government. And in fact, somehow local government has made up some of the cuts but given our overall financial difficulties at the moment, it can't do it any further. Sure. Thank you, Richard. Liz, can I can I bring you in at this point then? So thinking specifically uh, of LGBT plus people uh, uh, in regards to take up these types of services. Can you can you speak to that? Um, yeah, I can. I'm, I'm, I'm highly conscious that uh, Manira's time may be limited, so we okay. might want to get Manira in first. OK, sure. Manira, would you like to come in on that first? Um, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to stick around. So let's hear from oh, Liz. Thank you. She's far more so honestly. She, I, I'm really grateful to you protecting my time, Liz. But you're far more knowledgeable on this topic than I am. So right, I, it's okay. Uh, I'm happy for you to take the lead on it. Okay. Um, I mean, the HIV Commission is is quite clear in terms of new diagnosis. Uh, gay and bisexual men are uh, the highest group, uh, closely followed by heterosexual women, then heterosexual men, and then uh, black African people. And that is the story of um, of the, uh, uh, the the HIV epidemic in the last few years, and particularly in the last five years, since we've had access to things like PrEP, which we know works and works really well in uh, communities where there is a high level of information, a very big, su um, substantial degree of involvement, a lot of peer support, PrEP works really well. Okay. That said, um, there are also within the LGBT community, there is an issue about age. I'm old, right? I'm so old that I can remember when all of this started. I can remember Norman Fowler and the tombstone and don't die of ignorance and all of that, which, you know, has its detractors. <laughs> But it saved a generation of gay men. I'm sure of. Uh, I'm sure of that. Um, nowadays, I think we went through um, a few years ago. We went through a period of uh, almost like AIDS fatigue, really. Uh, and I think t I definitely know that uh, talking to the campaigners and, uh, and and particularly some of the younger people, um, the message about HIV dropped off the agenda and particularly it dropped off in schools. So I think I get a sense that there are now um, a generation of people coming through who almost get told about HIV alongside um, a battery of other uh, sexual health conditions and they're all put together what they are not told is that those other sexual health conditions are largely treatable 
Uh, and while HIV is treatable, it is not. It is it is medication for life at the moment. So I think we're, um, we're 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 in a bit of a situation there. But what what is masked in the figures is that while our outcomes for gay men are, are really good, um, outcomes for uh, people from Black and minority ethnic communities are real still really bad. Uh, and they had been bad all the way through. Uh, and despite the small uh, uh, organisations like the NAS project and some of the others who go out of their way to work with those communities, it's a real uphill battle. Um, and while it may be possible to end HIV infection by 2030, we will not end HIV infection if we don't end it in those communities. And that means that there needs to be a very big part on the big effort on the part of all of the NHS, all of the voluntary sector and community leaders to go out and address the issue of stigma, mm -hmm. which is huge, yeah. uh, particularly in those communities, stops people from uh, from coming along and being tested. Uh, and secondly, that we um, make we take HIV out of the HIV specialist services and into the mainstream of health. Mm -hmm. And that means that we then embark on uh, an opt-out uh, screening uh, program for for everybody. If we do that, mm. then we may well be on our way to ending and doing what is possible, which is to end transmission uh, by 2030. Brilliant, thank you, Liz, and brilliant uh, leading there for the next two questions. I'm going to bring uh, Manira in here. Thank you for being so patient, Manira. So, Gareth, if you could just bring the screen up, um, we're going to look at the first two action points, uh, and we discussed there. Um, uh, about educating people uh, around HIV um, and one of the things so Manira if I can come to you now please in terms of um, this particular action looking at wanting mandatory training for um, HIV uh, in healthcare settings which, which Liz just mentioned uh, and we know in the in the NHS and other healthcare settings primary and secondary uh, we know that the the lack of time for CPD and other development, lack of time for training is a big problem in healthcare, isn't it? Um, so would you would you certainly support this that all healthcare workers should get specialist training on, on HIV to reduce the stigma? Um, yeah, well, absolutely. And the, the point you make on CPD um, is a really important one. Uh, I mean, we constantly hear on uh, in relation to so many different conditions and diseases, the uh, that there is a lack of knowledge and lack of training time for uh, GPs, specialists and others on, on a whole range of conditions. Um, and this seems to me, I mean, if we are really serious uh, about uh, eradicating this uh, virus and uh, trying to or reduce transmission down to zero, um, having that uh, level of training uh, is is absolutely critical to that um, and it's it, to Liz's point about those hard to reach communities and, and groups well where they are potentially accessing uh, healthcare in terms of other specialisms and other services if that training is there in place then perhaps some of those uh, some of the necessary interventions and questions that need to be asked and the the, the testing that needs to be done can can be done uh, more appropriately and, and we can find some of those people that are we're necessarily struggling to reach so I think it's really important and, and I'd be very happy to support that. Great thank you and then on the second question and staying on yourself Manira um, on to the next page please Gareth. Um, we've got here as well so one of the key action points was about having an opt out rather than an opt in so if you happen to have routine blood screening um, mm -hmm. that, that, that it will automatically be tested for HIV as well so if you could speak to the specific point but also one of the big debates we're having at the moment is about what it is to be a liberal and what that means in society so could you always also talk to the you know those who might be concerned well actually this is affecting my liberty and, and I, I feel like it's it's not very very liberal can, can you can you talk about that in your answer as well well i mean opt out rather than opt in i think makes uh, a huge amount of sense mm -hmm. um and to, to make it a sort of routine part of of any blood test or or, or other the screening tests you're going through um to to me makes makes complete and utter sense in terms of how that affects us as liberals, well, I suspect whenever we go for blood tests, there's a whole host of things that are tested for. Now, I appreciate this is a quite a sensitive area, um, but, you know, 
liberalism is is not uh, just about uh, you know having free reign and doing whatever we want uh, without harming others. The John Stuart Mill of do no harm principle, and it's one I keep coming back to throughout the pandemic and how we respond to everything uh, through the pandemic. So I I don't see to to my mind finding out through a routine blood test that you happen to be HIV positive is not is not an assault on, on your the freedom of of you as an individual that's providing you with necessary important critical information in terms of uh yeah you know, how you live your life it's not uh, uh, and uh, and obviously that then needs to lead to changes in how you uh lead your life and uh, and interact with other uh, with potential partners um but I, to my mind I, I don't see how the the, the two are in conflict whatsoever it's about information being armed with information so that you can still act and have freedom uh, as an individual but to act responsibly yeah absolutely completely agree with that it's uh, having having the option of getting prevention and, and early treatment uh, very much like in the world of mental health then gives you the options later in life of to, to live your life the way you want to. So that's certainly a, a, a key point. So thank you for that. Um, uh, Richard, mindful, uh, you've got to go in a moment if you're still with us. Um, did you just want to have a brief word on the opt out rather than opt in um, before before you go? Uh, yes, I do have to go. It's another crisis meeting about a, a, a mayor that's been arrested. Very good for votes, incidentally. I recommend trying to get your yeah. local opposition leader uh, arrested. Uh, I, I very much agree with Munir, and it's the argument that we've been making right the way through the pandemic. You have an absolute right not to wear a mask, not to go to be tested, not to have a vaccine, providing you live in an entire bubble of one and don't affect anyone else at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I would have thought the same principle applies to opt in rather than opt out. I went to be tested and 135,000 people went to be tested in Liverpool, not because they had, they thought they had the, uh, uh, the, the virus, but because they wanted to know where they were. So they wouldn't affect mm. their neighbours, their old folk and their community. Uh, what they then did with the information, I'm not sure, but I know a lot of people then did go back and self-isolate uh, because they, the ones in my world told me what they'd done, but they did it from a, pos a position of greater knowledge. So I would uh, favour opt-in rather than opt-out, almost for everything, mm -hmm. providing the information is passed on to people, of course, in a sensitive and reasonable way. Great. Thank you for that uh, input. And uh, thank you for attending tonight, Richard. Appreciate okay. you going to go now. But Sorry, I have to go. I would like to learn more, but I know I've, you tell me to listen to Liz, which I often do anyway. <laughs> Thanks yeah. very much. Cheers. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Great. On to the next uh, page there as well, please, Gareth. And uh, I'm going to come uh, to Liz on this one. Um, so... Multi-year coordinated health promotion programs. That's very much linking to um, a lot around public health, which we know, as Richard and others have said, um, is uh, woefully low at the moment. Um, so you've mentioned PrEP. Of course, it was party policy. I think we were the first to, to call for PrEP. Mm -hmm. um, and we have groups like Team Prepster and I Want PrEP Now who, who do great information services for people. Um, and then also there's a second point to this, as well as a, um, a coordinated health promotion. Um, the Department for Health, health and Social Care, uh, a, a very um, detailed one here, a return on investment tool. Uh, so, Manir, I'll come to you in a moment as well. Um, but certainly health promotion programmes across all of the public sectors, schools, colleges, universities, is a big opportunity, uh, Liz. There is. I mean, one of the great shames is that um, as a result of the Health and Social Care Act, we've had a complete fragmentation of of much of the, the public health uh, initiative in this country. And that particularly includes reproductive health, uh, access to contraception and sexual health services. And it's a real false economy because um, if I address the second question as is we know um, just as we actually do know that um, for every pound that you put into uh, in into get, making sure that women ha uh, or men and women have access to appropriate con um, uh, con uh, 
contraception, there is a fourteen pounds return on that. In you know, in in part, that's a figure that we refer to a lot in terms of the overseas development uh, budget. So it is that people who work in HIV have done have managed to do an initial assessment, and I'm uh, forgive me, I haven't got the figures off the top of my head uh, about the uh, about the cost savings to the health service of uh, a of prep uh, and b of uh, testing and getting people into treatment uh, at an early stage so because the more you can do that the the, the less ill people are the less treatment that's a very expensive treatment they require we just need to be doing it in a much more um, uh, systematic way uh, than we're doing it now at the moment it's very patchy it's very down to um, local commissioning local enthusiasm by health and social care uh, uh, people working in health and decision making levels it shouldn't be it should be a national program yeah absolutely thank you uh, and Manira um perhaps if we start with the second point first uh, for yourself um when we get back into government and you're our um uh, health and social care secretary um a return on investment tool it, it sounds great doesn't it? it's a good idea Liz has laid out the benefits H- how do you think we would sort of um, present that to the public to to show that there's a real need for proper investment in prevention services. Um, if I may, the, the idea of a return on investment tool <laughs> seems to me so bloody blindingly obvious. <laughs> why does it? Why do we even need to be making the case? I mean, I'd say this for you know almost every part of um, you know, healthcare, uh, and and that's why you have many many thousands of health economists who are constantly looking at the cost of interventions versus the benefits and you know what's the opportunity cost and sorry you have to excuse me coming from a pharma background I did a lot of work with health economists when we were trying to prove the benefit of a particular new drug we were we were bringing to market so to my mind um, this is blindingly obvious and frankly a lot of the preventative uh, measures are, are, are a hell of a lot cheaper than um, some of the, the the further sort of downstream interventions that come into play. So um, having this sort of tool um, is critical. And, and, and we know, again, uh, going back to the point that um, Richard was making, you know, we've had local public health budgets decimated in recent years. And one of the challenges you've got in terms of proving return on investment is if this is going to be saving the healthcare system a hell of a lot of money further down the line, um, but the investment needs to come quite often from public health teams and local government. We know that silo budgeting uh, across government departments means that we often don't see necessarily that uh, that, that joined up thinking. So uh, a return on investment tool is is a fairly obvious thing to do. And I suspect it will uh, would reap a lot of dividends in terms of having much more proactive strategic uh, policy making and inter- you know, focusing on the interventions that really work and deliver the best bang for buck. Um, and yes, if I were health secretary, I'd be very <laughs> happy to, to, to take this up. When you are. Um, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think the key is as well around um, the funding. You rightly mentioned around the, the public funding or public health funding or lack of it. Um, in the NHS, we see astronomical sums where north of 150 billion a year now. Um, what would you say to those that argue that even that isn't enough? Because one of the problems we've historically found, especially at this time of year, pandemic or not, there's so much money that goes into acute services that the prevention services just don't get a look in. So do you think, not needing any numbers, do, do you think we, we need to go even further with the NHS budget? Well, uh, you know, the manifesto commitment at the last election was an extra penny on uh, income tax for health and social care. Um, so I think w- we do accept as a party that there does need to be further funding in the NHS. Um, it, it, it's not a popular thing to say within the party, but I think all of us who have used the healthcare system at various points have discovered where there are inefficiencies in the system and uh, I know that's quite a Tory argument to make but I still think uh, it's important to say that how how the system works uh, I think we could probably in many ways not least much better digitization of the NHS deliver uh, some savings and efficiencies to give us more headroom for growth Uh, But it's clear, given the ageing demographics and 
new technologies etc coming on stream that it's it's almost impossible for the nhs to keep up uh with demand um and therefore we we constantly need to be looking at uh, at creative ways of saving money to reinvest but also yes i think i think we had the right policy that we need to increase funding for the nhs absolutely the the, the it and the nhs has always been a great challenge I think. To, to still see some hospitals talking to each other via fax machine is is still an astounding thing isn't it oh yes i worked very briefly for nhs digital for 13 months um the reason i was only there briefly was it was one of the most frustrating professional experiences of my life um but you know they they talk about bonfire of the fax machines, but the, you know, it's the NHS that still keeps a small fax machine industry going. Um, mm. And um, although I should say, for, as a result of COVID, a lot of those frustrations that I experienced firsthand working for NHS Digital and I'm aware of talking to to former colleagues and people in that sector. Obviously, overnight, those many of those barriers and challenges had to be overcome because of COVID. And we're seeing far, far greater use of uh, technology and digital medicine as a result of COVID. Um, and the challenge now is how we make that permanent, uh, but in a way that doesn't create different barriers, because not everybody can access uh, healthcare services digitally. And also it isn't always the appropriate mechanism, mm -hmm. depending on the condition you have. So making sure that we bake in what we've, what we've learned and the new ways of doing things, but in a way that is, is inclusive. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so, Gareth, on to the next screen, please. And, and Liz, I'm going to come back to yourself now. So this is, uh, a, again, I think a, a fairly obvious one. And I, I'd agree with Manira that the investment tool is such an obvious thing, but it's so obvious we have to tell government to do it. Um, so this one is about local plans. And one of the key things we find is that local authorities have had their budgets cut and um, uh, gum clinics have had their budgets cut and so on. So, so two parts, really. Local plans sound like a good thing, um, but do you think you, we can do it with the current uh, investment so low in local authorities? And, and, and linking in sort of really further support, you, you discussed earlier about how we get other people in the community to, to support as well. Um, so LGBT plus centres are a, a, a rare thing still, unfortunately, in 2020. We've famously got a fantastic one over in Leicester uh, and some other places in the country. But what, what part do you think local community groups and charities can also play? Well, <clears throat> I think there's two things. I, th I think there has to be a national strategy for this that, and, and a national priority, for example, on things like testing and prep. Beyond that, it is entirely uh, right for local authorities and um, health regions or whatever to look at population uh, variations to work out what's the most uh, effective way for them to go about uh, doing stuff. So what might work in some boroughs in London or uh, in Leicester or in Manchester or whatever is different from what, what is needed in I don't know, rural Cumbria or, or whatever, but 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 nonetheless, um, there are some there are things that I think that that need to be done. Uh, first of all, I think for, for for general population testing things, we need to have a national program. So, the the national testing in maternity services, for example, has has uh, has had a huge effect on. Um, cutting down uh, tra tra mother to mother to child transmission, and we ought to be doing definitely testing has to be not not just uh, in HIV services but across the piece. But in order to get people and local populations into services, particularly uh, in areas where there is uh, some kind of hesitation around around it, for example, in testing, then I think that is local authorities really understanding the, the, com the communities in which they live and work and going out and finding the community leaders. I'm, um, I'm a big supporter of the NAS project and the NAS project works with uh, BAME communities on HIV. They have a, a testing faith program. They went out and they, they talked to faith leaders in community. They have imams in East London who run testing sessions in <laughs> in their religious places of worship that's the kind of 
basic shoe leather epidemiology public health program that we need to we need to work on and that is assisted by the nhs but it needs to be well and truly informed and led by communities absolutely thank you could i just at this moment um ask is mark lewis still on the call uh, i've just noticed in the chat that uh, mark you've you've called for people to be uh, pressing lib dem parliamentarians to join the appg on hiv aids um, have we got Mark on the call still? Would you like to just speak to that a moment? Um, I wasn't expecting to be spoken. Uh, oh, that's OK. I just thought it was a great, a great point you've made there to, to, to get people. The, the link is in the chat box. Yeah, the best person to speak about it would be the vice chair, who is Baroness Barker. Um, so uh, the best person to sell it would be uh, uh, Liz. <laughs> OK, thanks for dropping it in, Mark. Uh, so back to you, Liz sell it <laughs> well what can i tell you it was the first appg that i joined uh when i joined parliament i i'm not the longest serving member of it uh, i'm a member of the house of lords years we do um tremendous work uh bringing uh everybody from you know people from pharma from voluntary organizations ministers all together uh we tend to work we work both nationally and in domestically and internationally we tend to alternate reports between an international issue and a domestic issue so uh last year we did a domestic issue so we did mental health and hiv services a uh, year before that we did um access to uh, access to medications I think in middle income countries if I get that right uh, and we work on the principle that um, we can't solve HIV here if we don't solve HIV across the whole world and um, it's a group which has been going for a long long time and we work also with other uh, um, all parliamentary groups across the world and so at that time about five or six years ago when there was definite HIV fatigue it was important that we came together with other people to get through that and to make sure that HIV went back up you know kept up on the, the political agenda it's a really good um, a, a PPG, and I strongly commend that you go and look at uh, some of our uh, reports, which are really excellent. Great, thank you. So, yeah, so everyone on the um, on the uh, call now, you can see the link is in there from Mark. It's uh, apbghivaids.org.uk. We will be uploading this uh, to uh, YouTube um, soon, and what we'll do is we'll put all the key links in in the text as well, so that people can can visit. So good, thank you. So Gareth, if we can go to the last uh, sort of question, we'll have a further discussion around this and then what we'll also do is get more questions from, from the, uh, the audience. So um, uh, Manira, if I can start with yourself, please. Again, I suppose we could say this is another self-evident one, but getting NHS England uh, and local authorities, remember this commission is specifically looking at reducing transmission in England. So working with the Department for Health and Social Care, but different agencies working with each other again collaboration sounds so obvious doesn't it I, I do know one thing we did do as a as a party before we left government we started to get the health department to talk to the other departments and realize that the work can't be done in a silo can it do you think there's more that could be done on that uh yes well i mean as you say it's uh, again it's blindingly obvious yeah it is something um that nhs england and local authorities i think often struggle to do uh, actually, the rollout of the vaccine as a case in point is being entirely led by the NHS and the government, uh, the lo local government are just sort of seen as, as a supporting partner role when I think actually local authorities should be at the heart of the of the uh, rollout of the, the vaccine, vaccine um, not least because they know the communities so well um, and, and all the hard to reach groups um, that we've also talked about in this uh, call. So, um, Yes, there needs to be much closer working of NHS and uh, local authorities um, and DHSC. Um, interestingly, obviously at a local and regional level, there is already quite a lot of uh, fairly organic change going on, which we will see probably brought forward in terms of legislation in due course. So, it, you know, I... I can't comment uh, in a detailed way about the sexual health services at a local level. It's not something I'm close to, if I'm very honest. But I think we are seeing greater uh, 
a bit more joined up working, certainly between different agencies, if not so much with local authorities. I'm talking about the different parts of the NHS, certainly at a local and regional level. And some of that uh, reorganisation will be baked in uh, via legislation, we think, next year. Um, but yes, uh, I think there needs to be much more joined up working and whether that's done through... I mean, I don't know how effective people think health and local, local health and well-being boards are, whether that needs to be formalised in a greater way. I think I think we've got to be very careful. I know as Lib Dems, we've in the past committed ourselves to sort of NHS reorganisation based on you know, local government lines. And I think nobody wants major reorganisations. They want more like a hole in the head. So I think personally, I'd be wary of calling for that but trying to find better ways to incentivise and encourage local authorities and NHS bodies to work together. I think the incentivisation is an interesting point because, of course, we know with clinical commissioning groups, CCGs, if, yeah. if, if they don't have a particular um, sort of interest in something or, or they have more interest in something else, uh, you know, especially if, if there's a particular issue in a, in a local area that requires more funding, um, what, what do you think we can do to incentivize CCGs and, and well-being boards to sort of take this up? Well, I mean, if I come, if we go back to the point about return on investment, I mean, some sort of gain share model um, might make sense. So, you know, invest, you know, if a local authority uh, is investing in preventative uh, action and, and early intervention uh, in a particular disease area, whether it's sexual health or, or other area, uh, and that can can be shown to drive down uh, rates of infection or you know, stopping other diseases developing, whether it's diabetes or whatever it might be. If you, if you can link it, link that preventative or early intervention work to the outcomes, um, then clearly you can quantify the cost savings. And then having some sort of gain share model between the local authority and the NHS body, I think is a is an obvious way of incentivizing. I mean, I'm just talking off the top of my head here. This is not a Liberal Democrat policy. This is just a, a principle that I think is a would be an obvious way to to be to incentivize that kind of joined up working. Sure, maybe something to bring to conference at some point in the future. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a, a great input there. Thank you. And then back to you, Liz. Um, so again, collaboration, a really obvious, sensible thing. Um, any particular areas you'd start with? I would, um, I would, I would do two things. I would look at, uh, well, I, what I would look at is the complete fracturing of uh, funding for uh, sexual and reproductive health and and HIV services, uh, none of which are, I think are are right. I mean, I, th I think. I think when we were in government, we were absolutely right to take the view that public health is a matter which should, our public health is best addressed uh, in terms of prevention, uh, way before people get, have a need to go to the NHS. Unfortunately, what happened was that we gave local authorities a load of powers, and at the same time, the government, or just shortly thereafter, the government then butchered their funding. And what we've now got, instead of cooperation, is we've got um, fractured services competing. Uh, and um, all over the place, people are um, being pushed, from, people in need are being pushed from pillar to post um, with ever more, uh, uh, ever, an ever greater level of need. So I think that what we need to, to do is when we are planning or there is the planning of these integrated, these ICSs, integrated care services, we need to make sure that things like sexual and reproductive health are um, basic services and not special, not hived off into some kind of specialised uh, ring, ring fenced or separated service, but they are seen as an integral part of health. Uh, and therefore, we make sure that there is a clear pathway uh, from prim primary care into secondary care for them. And, and um, also one of the key things that we've been talking about for years, both in the party and, and wider society, is the integration of NHS and social care. Um, do, do you think the, the integration we're looking for means that we shouldn't see uh, reproductive and sexual health seen as a small clinic on the outskirts of a town? Should we have that as part of the overall, um, you know, sort of offering within a healthcare setting? I think we have to understand that there are some 
uh, people uh, for whom uh, clinics uh, uh, are, are are the are the place with the absolutely the place that they that they need to go. For other people, it is um, it is reproductive right and you know part of their uh, maternity services if they're they're women. And there are other people for whom to whom GPs might be might be the right place. And others, it may be the voluntary sector. I just think you have a range of different approaches for different people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Personalised care is, is very much needed, isn't it? It's a, a, a social offering, but certainly needs to be personalised to, yeah. to, to each um, need. Uh, Manira, could I just come back to you on, on PrEP, um, if that's OK? Um, we, we know that it's been sort of slightly expanded across the country, but it still isn't the case that if someone wants PrEP, they can request it and then it gets paid for. Still a bit of an argument between the NHS and local authorities about who should pay. Um, do, do you think we've got a, a bright future or do you think we're going to struggle for a, a while longer with PrEP provision? Um, I'll be honest, it's not something I'm, I'm very close to in terms of the details, but clearly in terms of rolling out a provision of, of PrEP, I mean, it's like any other part of the health service. It's uh, down to the challenges in terms of funding and resources. Whenever a new treatment is introduced to the to, to the NHS, there is always a lot of variation in take up and provision. You see quite a lot of postcode lottery um, in terms of uh, commissioning right across uh, England, in my experience, of any new treatment being made available. So. Uh, it doesn't surprise me and it takes the NHS a very long time generally to adopt um, new treatments uh, and provide comprehensive coverage. Sure, thank you. I know there was a problem for a while as well with the, the um, it was a proprietary drug. So as it hadn't moved on to um, generic medication, that was obviously impinging the cost, which we understand is part of the part of the picture. Uh, and then back to you, Liz, anything else you'd like to say on, on PrEP per provision? Well, I think there is a wide level of ignorance still about the effectiveness of PrEP. So I think we still need to be doing the sort of basic work around uh, about how it works, who, when it works, and the importance of the fact that, that if somebody is uh, undetectable, they're, then they're, they're, un you know, they're untransmissible. And that the, the effect of doing that and, the, 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 and, and spelling out in terms uh, the monetary savings is something that we have to do uh, on a much more systematic basis than has been done during the trial. Yeah, thank you. And I know, I mean, this is only anecdotal evidence, but I have, you know, heard people talking about or telling me that, you know, that they, some people with, because we don't have a proper education program around um, HIV um, itself, is that some people think this one pill will help them with everything when of course it's it's a very specific treatment. So um, certainly lots more education. And it was mentioned earlier on by, I think yourself and um Richard with regards to schools and they must be doing more as well and educating people I think somebody in the chat has actually put um, what, what I'll call PHSE personal health and sexual education um, a lot of PHSE uh, a lot of it done in uh, schools that don't have to follow the curriculum such as academies and, and so on yet the curriculum itself doesn't mandate it so it, it's quite a tussle for us in in school settings and and colleges and so on um, I'm just having a look through the chat line to see if we can uh, uh, have anything. Uh, so Eugene, we've got a, a, a nice point from you there. You volunteer on the, the Terence Higgins Trust Helpline. Um, do you want to just, uh, if you're happy to, uh, would you like to speak to your point there about um, the, the testing point that you've raised? Uh, sure. Yeah, it was just a point around uh, the discussion about sort of different ways of testing and clinics versus primary care and that sort of thing. Um, we, we get a lot of people who call up and, you know, it's an anonymous helpline, so they're, they, they're a bit um, more uh, open sometimes than they, maybe they would be otherwise. But there are people who would never go to their GP for anything to do with sexual health, um, just for reasons of anonymity and things like that. Um, so there needs to be some kind of option for them. But when you when somebody says, where can I test for HIV? A lot of the testing went online well before the, the pandemic. 
And during the pandemic, online testing was the way to go. So you fill in all your details and they send you a kit. Now, again, some people for that, that's not going to work because they don't want a kit sent to their home because mm. maybe they're mm. living with someone that they don't want to know that they're testing and stuff like that. So, um, so there have to be different options. But for the people who that does work for, that's great, except it completely depends on where you are in the country, how you actually access an, a, an online kit. And it can depend on your local authority. In London, it's shl.uk. In some parts of the UK, it's test.hiv. Um, the way the test works is different depending on where you live. Uh, it would be nice if there was a, just you know one simple way of telling people this is how you do it. Now during HIV testing week, uh, which is normally in November and now it's in February next year, uh, there is one way to do it. Um, and so that, that's a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I think there needs to be a, a range of different options for people, but it needs to also be simple. And one of the problems with the, you know, people who access tests at home or they buy a test kit from the pharmacy or whatever is you don't necessarily get that follow up care. So um, if somebody tests positive uh, and they're completely on their own in that kind of scenario, that can be, you know, that can be a really difficult thing for them to go through. And they don't have, you know, necessarily someone that they're talking to about the fact that this has happened and what it means and stuff like that. So um, all of it kind of has to be thought, thought through together as one kind of whole solution uh, and at the moment it's a bit of a postcode lottery as far as I can see. Good stay on Eugene I've got another question for you great to have you on. Gareth we've finished with the screen there now thank you you can drop that off so Eugene thank you could, could I also ask you that I, I wanted to raise this on a call we've seen then uh, is it from April next year that the um, so-called misnamed gay blood ban that ignores buying other people we see that there's going to be a change um, based on new evidence is that right? Yeah, so I, I just read that myself today. Um, it's, it's brand new information, but yeah, um, it's, it's going to be based on a set of criteria rather than based on who you sleep with. So yeah, um, yeah it's, it's a step in the right direction, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Eugene. Appreciate your input there. Thank you. So um, do we have any particular questions that um, anybody would like to raise? Um, you can do it by, I think you pressed the little, uh, the little hand button. Um, remind me, Gareth, how do they raise their hand in the chat? Is it? So if you go to participants and then hover on your own, over your own name, right. then you can click raise hand. So we're going to have anyone raise their hand. We can get some questions to Manir and Liz. Anyone going to be brave? Gareth, you must have a question. Come on. Oh, Manira does need to go. Manira, um, would you like to sort of close off then? Thank you again for coming on tonight. I very much appreciate your time. Um, so do you, do you think we as, as a party can support this and, and push the DHSC to, to take this on? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually, with Liz being on the call, I just want to thank her for all her work in this area. I know she's a huge champion and advocate uh, around the, you know, not just HIV and AIDS, but the whole area of sexual health. And 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 thank you, Liz, for all that you do for the party and for the way you speak up on these issues in the Lords. Um, so, you know, I, I'm delighted, and many of you will have seen Ed uh, did a video on the day of the launch, and that's on the on the HIV Commission website. So, uh, yes, we absolutely should be supporting and championing this. I think I I just need to manage expectations. There's only one of me. Mm -hmm. uh, in the health team in the commons clearly because there's only 11 of us sadly um, and a very limited staffing support uh, so the range I mean health and social care is such a massive brief and there's any number of thousands of topics I can be pursuing so mm -hmm. if I'm not doing very much on this it's not because I don't care or I'm not interested there's so many is important issues but you know we have to be ruthlessly picking one or two issues where we're not doing COVID, which has pretty much dominated my time this year, um, to to champion. And um, uh, that's that's the directive from Ed, and he's quite right, which is why the Lord's team uh, is so important, because there's a lot more of them, uh, and there are a number of them who are working on health-related uh, issues. And as I say, Liz, Liz is the big champion in this area. So, yes, we will support, but um, forgive me if I'm not banging on about it week in, week out. 
No, I appreciate all of that. Manira, thank you very much for your time. No, I really cool. appreciate it, especially given the hectic day. Well, when is a day not hectic for you at the moment? But yes. uh, but really, just as a general point, really appreciate all of the work that you and the team are doing around uh, the terrible situation we've got at the moment. Light at the end of the tunnel with vaccines, but we've obviously got a long way to go, haven't we? Let's, Let's hope. keep I our masks on in public. I think we've got, we're in for a very rocky few weeks. Yes. To be honest, uh, the numbers we were shown this morning um, by officials were pretty scary to be mm. honest yeah january is going to be a difficult time post christmas as well isn't it so yeah, yeah. good thank you very much uh Manira. very much appreciate your time thank you not at all thank you take care thank you Bye. thank you very much well, we've got a flurry of hands going up now so we've got so lucy would you like to go first what's your question please welcome um hi um so I a friend of mine last year um, went on prep, but only basically after after a scare and going through a load of tests. And they then said, "We can put you on prep. Would you like to do that?" Um, how um, essentially how can we ensure that that we don't we aren't relying on waiting for people to have a an HIV scare before they get the chance to go on prep? Essentially, I think particularly. Uh, I've got a lot of younger friends who are very aware of the fact that because it's the awareness has gone down, kind of it's not so much of a kind of we're not on such high alert and it's not really covered in sex education at all. Mm. That it's very much up to them to, first of all, be aware of the risks and any research is entirely up to them to do and then kind of refer themselves to where where they need to go. Um, sorry, it's kind of a two-part question. How, yeah, essentially, how can we make sure that those people are? It doesn't require you have to have to have a scare to then know about prep and be given the option. And also, what can we do in terms of the education side of things um, with the fact that it's kind of just general awareness has gone down in the last sort of 15, 15, 20 years? I don't know. No, good points, Liz. You were speaking to much of this earlier, weren't you? Would you like to come back on that? Um, yeah, well, I mean, this is. I mean, first of all, the the RSE uh, curriculum has now been agreed. Um, the key thing about the RSE uh, curriculum is that we know that uh, hard pressed teachers uh, really need materials that they can use, can almost have done the, the, the work and the thinking for them. We also know that the people who are um, most um, uh, m most well resourced to to pump out um, resources uh, are people who quite often have a very um, different take on uh, matters of sexuality uh, than uh, than we would have uh, people so uh, and a poor hard, hard pressed teacher gets sent a load of stuff and they don't often have time to evaluate what, what they're being given so I think the first and key thing the fundamental thing to do is to make sure that teachers and children in schools have access to reliable uh, information which uh, backs up the key points uh, of the curriculum uh, and is inclusive. And then the second thing from, from there on in, I think, is to make sure that all primary uh, care professionals know about HIV, whatever their, their particular specialism is, so that when people have those, uh, and particularly young people, have chance encounters with people in the health service, as opposed to going to a specialised service, then people are looking for uh, the, um, the, 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 the indicators and signs that this is actually something that they should be talking to a young person about and steering them towards appropriate services. Good. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for the question, Lucy. Uh, Eugene, I'll come back to you in a moment. Matthew, you've got your hand up. Would you like to ask your question? Welcome, Matthew. Hi. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, I wanted to ask Liz, especially as she's both LGBT plus spokesperson and voluntary sector spokesperson, as she knows I chaired the Board of Trustees at the LGBT Centre for a number of years until earlier this year. Um, actually, we're separate to, to trade sexual health in Leicester, but both are charities. Um, as you've already mentioned, the real issue is, is funding. And for charities, more generally, the real issue is funding. And so many have gone to the wall over the past number of months. Um, I guess this goes beyond the specific um, issue we're talking about tonight, but it's pertinent to it. But though many of these services are run by charities, what can be done and, and what questions is she asking about helping charities at this time? Cheers. 
Thank you, Matthew. Liz. Um, well, there's been a whole load of uh, questions that we've done, which have been specifically around COVID. Um, I think that the um, the government's uh, response to charities and COVID funding was completely and utterly inadequate. Charities knew that just for the first lockdown, they were going to lose about four billion pounds, uh, and the government ordered, uh, offered them seven hundred and fifty thousand. And when you put that in up alongside the amount of money that has been squandered, the billions that have been squandered on track and trace and PPE contracts, I makes my 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 blood boil. Um, I think the I, I, th I think I don't think one should ever be a Pollyanna about uh, the pandemic. The pandemic has been truly awful. But given the disproportionate outcomes for poor communities and minority communities, I think that now more than ever, um, people in the NHS uh, should understand that, that when it comes to health matters like COVID, like HIV, they cannot get to the people that they need to get to without those community organisations. And therefore, there has to be some basic funding it's not an add-on it has to be an essential part of any kind of community uh, health strategy and i think it's just for some of us to keep on standing up and doing that return on investment uh, argument uh, return on investment is not just about return on investment for appeal or a, or a course of treatment uh, return on investment is return on investment in the people in the voluntary sector who get to the people who are most in need Absolutely, thank you. Um, and Matthew, obviously, you've done a lot of work um, on youth services. So certainly, youth services um, providers could could certainly help with the education side around uh, HIV Lee, and the treatments. Do you mind if I ask just one very quick follow up question? Then no, I'll be quiet. What 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 does Liz make? And I think I know the answer to this, but I think it's good for us to hear it. What does Liz make of the recent article in I think it was the Mail on Sunday by the chair of the Charity Commission? saying that charities should stop campaigning and basically go home and do the knitting. And was she offended as I was? I'm sure she was. <laughs> right. I don't read the mail on Sunday. Um, I, no, neither I, do I, but it was on Twitter. I, I yeah. do know, I do know that, I do know the, the article to which you refer. I questioned that appointment at the time that it was made. I questioned whether that person uh, had the... Uh, skills and knowledge and competence to carry out that job um, that person's not going to stand for another term in that post and I think I'll leave it there <laughs> good thank you so Eugene just before I come to you for everyone else we have got time for one more question after Eugene so if you've got anything you really want to ask then pop your hand up um, but just before I come to you, Eugene, um, uh, a quick note for the chat box. Gareth is going to kindly put the links in. Uh, as you may be aware, at the start of the call, we noticed this is a joint event uh, with LGBT plus Lib Dems uh, and the LDHCA, Lib Dem Health and Care Association. So Gareth's going to pop the links to join either or hopefully both organisation uh, uh, into the into the box there. Um, so please do uh, have a look there and contact us if you want any more information. Um, so, uh, Eugene, on to back to yourself for your question, please. Uh, thanks. Um, so my question, I think I've been in the Lib Dems too long because my question is going to be about local government. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it, basically, uh, a lot of the sexual health services are commissioned locally. Um, and obviously, one of the areas where Lib Dems have some power at the moment is in, in some local authorities. So I guess my question is around um, what can we do working with Lib Dems in local government to uh, make sure that they're commissioning uh, STI testing, HIV services and stuff like that in, in the right way? So uh, just before I come to you, Liz, Liam and Simon, you got your hands up at the same time. So I'll take both your questions before we finish. So, so Liz, what can we get more in uh, local Lib Dem local uh, associations? Well, one of the things that we've been doing during the pandemic, um, given that Manira's right, we have very limited resources in terms of her time and so on, is that every sort of few weeks we've, we've got 
uh, some of our key people in uh, local government, but who have responsibility for health and social care, just to join us for a small meeting uh, for about an hour, where we we just run through what's happening in different areas of the country with with all the COVID stuff about testing, uh, about what vaccination programme, all of that. Um, I think that we could do, um, now that we have the blessing and the curse of Zoom and teams and all of that we could make use of the um of the technology that we have to have little briefing meetings like this every so often on health topics with our people in local government they have a lot to tell us and we have quite a lot to share with them it's a m m mutually beneficial thing to do uh, if we just put our minds to it i'm not advocating having meetings for the sake of having meetings mm -hmm. uh, but i am advocating making good use of the technology Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks for that question, Eugene. And, and obviously, again, thanks to the, the volunteering you do. It's uh, obviously a great help. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I think, Liam, you, you offered to go. Uh, oh, Simon, you've let Simon. So go on then, Simon, give us your question. Oh, we can't hear you, Simon. Is that better? Yeah, go for it. Wonderful. Um, sorry, I've lost my train of thought now. So in 2018, 40% of HIV diagnoses were late. Um, so like more than four years after they occurred, which obviously has quite a significant knock-on impact, um, transmission of And obviously the biggest barrier to that is, as we're saying, like the fact that testing is so fractured. So like um, you were saying earlier about SHL in London, but there were still, th even so many years after SHL was founded, there are three um, London boroughs where it's not available, so Croydon, Greenwich and Hillingdon. And so is there any, and then um, the same like if I move around the country to go to university or anything like that, move for a job, again, I've got to find out, track down which different resource it is, where I can access it, if it's postal kits or only in person and so on. And it's um, like what different attempts can we do to try and make that more accessible? Because even if you've got different providers providing the actual testing in each area, for example, surely it wouldn't be, there's much of our problems with like big NHS um, IT projects, having one, um, link that uses your location and everything to decide this is your provider like we've all got phones we've all got that like it surely that technology is a bit outdated like it's about time that we had greater focus and access to um universal testing pretty much i yeah Thank you, Simon. I certainly know in the in the world of, of mental health provision, there's a, a wonderful service called IAPT, IAPT, uh, mm. that is a quick one one location search uh, on an AHS website. But unless you know what that weird name stands for, you'd never know to look for it. So, yeah, cert certainly having um, digital platforms for, for ease of access. But it's 2020 now, Liz, and we've all got apps and smartphones and Zooms and all sorts. So why can't we get digital right in healthcare? There's a big one. <laughs> uh, let's be clear that since March, digital has and the NHS has just changed out of all recognition. Uh, uh, and I think that that we are going to have uh, digital pr uh, progress at a at an, at an amazing rate. I think what you have to understand is that for some people. Um, I think it's particularly a sort of age, uh, um, perhaps an age difference. There are some people who have got no problems with digital who um, and because it's how they live their lives and so on. There are some people who have just some more reservations, A, because they didn't grow up where, with that technology uh, and because they do have concerns about, um, about privacy and data handling and so on. So... Um, I, I also think that it's true that there are some people who, for whom they're, they're quite happy doing everything online, including uh, having discussions with people. There are others for whom that's a step that they've not yet taken and having an, an in-person discussion uh, is important. So I think we need a bit of a mix, but I have no doubt at all that uh, there will be a, just a massive increase in all things about digital access within the NHS over the next two years. Okay. 
Good, thank you. And certainly we were talking earlier, a lesson seemingly learnt from the mass testing of uh, coronavirus in Liverpool is that those who didn't have proper access to digital platforms were immediately excluded from the service. So you're absolutely right. It has to be a, a, a certainly a mixed provision of service in, in local areas. So good, thank you. So we are going to um, finish the last uh, input. So Liam, you wanted to make a point for us. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I'm Liam, I work at Tarrant Second Trust. I just wanted to put on record, oh, thank you. Welcome. Thank, thank you very much to um, the Lib Dems for organising this, and in particular, thank you to Gareth, who I was in contact with um, prior to the HIV Commission um, report being launched. So a, a big thank you to that and um, for all the speakers as well. And I think that, you know, the, the main message I'm certainly taking from this is that um, the HIV Commission's report has given us a roadmap and a blueprint to something that even 10 years ago we did not imagine would be possible. And I think that charities, we can be sometimes um, guilty of always looking to the highest tiers in terms of um, political representation. But this report makes it very clear that it will require input not only from people in Parliament in both House of uh, Houses, but also all the way down to local government and the Lib Dems have got a very strong presence there. So. Um, you know, we'll hopefully be working with all kind of different representatives of Lib Dems. And just to quickly touch on a point that Baroness Barker raised, and I think it's really important, is that we need a mix of um, solutions to this, in particular when it comes to testing, which is one of the key recommendations. And um, one of the most striking stats I read recently was that we're seeing an increase of HIV, albeit a small, a small numbers, but of people over the age of 50, and in particular people presenting an accident and emergency, who've got to the point where their health has deteriorated to such a point, they then are receiving an HIV positive diagnosis. So it's really important that in all this messaging, we're, we're clear that it has to be reaching all ages and all different demographics in order for us to get to that 2030 goal. Um, but just to say, yeah, thank you very much um, for hosting this really important event, and hopefully it can lead to further points of action as well so thank you great well thank you for coming on Liam thanks for all the work you do I'm actually going to have you a second final say I'm going to let you finish by telling us what do we as a political party as activists in our local area what, what can we be doing to really help push this commission report forward I think talking about it, I think that making it very clear it can be done and also we've got a policy document to get there Often we talk about things as just being aspirational, but I think this document makes it very clear that it can be done, but it's heavily reliant upon everyone playing their part. So whether that's whether that is elected representatives or even people in their day-to-day -day conversations, we've all got a role in terms of addressing HIV stigma. So having those discussions, getting people talking about HIV, you know, Baroness Barker talked about the AIDS fatigue that there was only fairly recently. Moving that conversation and moving the dials so we're talking about the huge advances there has been in HIV. It's a success story. It's a real success story that we've got to the point now where an HIV diagnosis for the most people can be, most people can live a long and healthy life. Let's get talking about that. Let's get more people getting tested and um, let's make real progress towards 2030. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Liam. That's great. And then with England on the way, we can go with Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland as well. We'll have a model, model that works. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Liam. Thank you to, to you and all of your colleagues that, for all the work you do. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Um, uh, Liz, um, any final words from you to, to close the session? Uh, and a thank you as well, echoing really from Anira, from all of us here as well, all the work that you've done for a very long time and continue to do so. It's very much appreciated. So thank you. Um, would you like to say a final word to close up, please? Yeah. Um, the very first political party to uh, put forward policy on HIV and services for people with HIV was Liberal Democrats very first political party leader to go and visit the THT, the newly opened THT offices, was David Steele. And he did that long before Princess Diana went along to London Lighthouse. Why? Because we recognised early on that people who were facing HIV as a challenge in their life not only had health needs, but they were facing discrimination and prejudice. We have been there since long before it was a trendy thing to do. Um, over 30 years ago, um, Age Concern, as it then was, produced a report uh, called A Crisis of Silence, and it was about older people and HIV, older people uh, being aged over 50, uh, 55. I took part in that work. Um, we've been there since the beginning. We don't often get the credit for having been there since the beginning and having stuck our, st continued to be there 
in the days when other people have got tired and fed up and wandered away. But we are Liberal Democrats. We will be there. We will be there till the end, till this thing is beaten, not just here, but around the world. So thank you very much, everybody, for giving up your time. This is a fight that will be won inch by inch, town by town, country by country. Uh, but it's people like you who make sure that the fight continues in the way that is it, it the way that it uh, it needs to do until this is finally 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 an issue of the past. So thanks very much, everybody, and keep up the good work. Excellent, Liz. Thank you so much. So thank you everybody for coming on. Thank you to Gareth as chair of. Uh, yeah. LGBT plus Lib Dems uh, for organising the event and being my wonderful aide this evening. Um, we'll send you out the links to the details. Uh, you can watch this on YouTube at a later date. But hivcommission.org.uk. Download, spread, share, tweet, re retweet, share all you like and promote the word uh, and uh, work on your local areas. So thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you to everybody else and have a good evening. Thank you too. Bye. <laughs>